All right, so let's go ahead and get started on xenobiotic metabolism. What is xenobiotics? We should really get an understanding of that first before we start talking about all this other stuff. So xenobiotics, they are basically any particular substance that is not naturally present in the body or it's not produced by the body or it's in higher concentrations than usual within the human body, okay? We're primarily gonna to refer to these as drugs. This is the detoxification function of liver. So whenever you hear people talking about, oh man, the liver is a detoxification center. It is. And some of the things that it can detoxify or metabolize is tons and tons of different types of drugs that we take on a daily basis or certain types of toxins that might even be present in the body as well, all right? So let's go ahead and get started on this. So when we talk about xenobiotic metabolism, we have to remember that there's gonna be two phases of xenobiotic metabolism. So we're gonna take a little scenario here. Let's say that we take in some type of drug. Doesn't matter what it is. We take in that drug, we ingest it, let's say we take it orally. We get it absorbed across our digestive system, right, into the hepatic portal system, and then it gets taken to the liver. When it gets taken to the liver, let's follow and see what happens. So let's go ahead and represent this, like here, let's do it like this, like a little pill. Here's gonna be like our little pill right there, right? So here's the pill. This is the drug that we are going to start metabolizing right here, okay? Now usually the drugs that we have inside of our body are usually hydrophobic, okay? In other words, they don't like to you know, mix with water. So usually, because of that, they have tons of hydrogens. So they're saturated with hydrogens, which again, is not very good for interacting with water. Okay, so one of the things that we wanna do right away when we get this drug into the liver is we wanna send it to specific organelles located within the hepatocytes. So here, let's draw, ooh, let's use this. Here's going to be a nice little endoplasmic reticulum. So in your liver, you have these things called smooth endoplasmic reticulum. All right, and this guy is super important. There's tons and tons of enzymes in here. Like, look, let's actually have like one enzyme right here. Look, there's one enzyme, and he's gonna be present in here. And this is gonna be a group of enzymes that are super, super crucial in the metabolism of a bunch of different types of drugs. What is the name of this enzyme group? Okay, this is super important. You have to remember this one. This is your cytochrome P450 complex. What in the heck does that mean? What the heck is cytochrome P450? Cytochrome P450, it's obviously a, it's gonna be a certain type of protein that contains a heme within it, right? Kind of just like hemoglobin. Now, this protein complex is super, super critical for us detoxifying these drugs. Now, what the heck does this 450 come from? What does that mean? So cytochrome is the family. It's the super family of enzymes. 450 comes from, if you take a cytochrome, like a heme molecule, and you bind it onto carbon monoxide, the maximum wavelength that that pigment can absorb is around 450 nanometers. So that's where that 450 comes from. So again, cytochrome P450 is a group of enzymes. It's a super family of enzymes that are super, super important in the metabolism of these xenobiotic chemicals. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what happens first. Now the cytochrome P450, what are they gonna do to this drug? Let's say we bring this drug, we shuttle it in here into the smooth, endoplasmic reticulum. So what is this right here? This is our smooth ER, our endoplasmic reticulum. There's a group of these enzymes, cytochrome P450. What are they gonna do to this drug? These are primarily, the cytochrome P450 complex is primarily what's called oxidases. In other words, they love to introduce oxygen into this drug compound. So what are they gonna to try to do? Their function is they're going to try to introduce or insert a oxygen atom into the compound. That is their significance, okay? Now, these are gonna be the primary ones, okay? So what are they gonna do? So let's say we take this drug here. We have it interact with the cytochrome P450 complex. After they interact with it, what they will do is they'll take an add-on, they'll insert an oxygen into this, usually by what's called hydroxylation reactions. It could be oxidation, it could be reduction reactions, it could be hydrolysis reactions. 
But we're going to say that what it's going to do is it's going to insert oxygen onto this drug. So now what we're going to see is something like this, an OH. This is super polar. Okay, this is going to be super, super important because the whole purpose of this xenobiotic metabolism is to take a drug that's not really polar, pretty hydrophobic, and turn it into something that's more polar, things that can either dissolve or be soluble within our urine, soluble within our fecal matter, or maybe even soluble within the blood plasma so we can go and send it to different organs that we need that drug to be useful for. Okay, so that's important. So first thing we're going to do is perform this oxidation reaction. So again, what kind of reactions would it do? It could do a couple. It can do oxidation reactions. It can do what's called reduction reactions. It can do what's called hydrolysis reactions. Super, super important that we understand that for the cytochrome P450 complex, okay? Now, for this cytochrome P450 complex, there's a bunch of different enzymes that compose it. What are some of the enzymes that make up the cytochrome P450? I want you not to remember all of them. I just want you to remember a couple of them that are super, super important. What are some of these? One of the big ones, if you don't remember any of them, please at least remember this one. This one is called CYP3A4. Now, here's what I want you guys to understand. CYP is the super family. Three represents the family. A, that letter right there, it's representing the subfamily, and then four is representing the gene that's producing the proteins responsible for the metabolism of these drugs. This one is super important. Okay, so again, what does this stand for here? Let's do it in different colors so we can make sense of it. So CYP, let's do here, purple is gonna be three. We'll do red as A. And then we'll do four as this maroon color. Actually, let's make it completely different. Let's do pink. Okay. So again, the CYP, this stands for super family. So it stands for super family. It's a super family of enzymes. The three, that purple color, that's representing the family. Okay. The red, is representing the subfamily. Okay, so this is the subfamily. And then the last one, which is the pink, that is specifically representing the gene. The gene will let lead to the transcription of a particular mRNA that'll be translated to a particular protein that'll function in this metabolic process. So again, this is going to be the gene that'll lead to the particular isozyme. All right, so that's important. Now, why is this one specifically important? Because it is the one that controls the metabolism of 50% of the available drugs out there on the market. You can see why now this one is the most important to remember. So he controls almost 50% of all the available drugs out there. That's how many drugs he can metabolize. Pretty, pretty important. One more that's really important, and it's important because of clinical reasons. Another one is called CYP. Let's stay consistent with the colors. 2D6, 2, again, representing the family, D here in red representing the subfamily, and then the pink, which represents the gene that will lead to the produ production of a particular protein there, that is going to be a very, very important one, clinically, okay? There, the reason why this one's important is there are certain polymorphisms, okay? So different types of polymorphisms can lead to certain people having different um, variants in that gene. So what do I mean? Some people in this particular gene might be slow metabolizers, okay? So some might be very slow metabolizers. In other words, they don't produce a lot of this particular enzyme, so they can't metabolize a particular drug, okay? Other ones, which is super, super important to remember, can be what's called ultra rapid metabolizers. Okay, what does this mean? So what this means is, let's pretend here, okay, well actually not pretend, but let's be specific. This enzyme is very, very critical to metabolizing a particular drug. Do you know what that drug is called? It's called codeine. So here's the drug right there. And what it's responsible for doing here 
is it's responsible for taking a drug called codeine. And when it metabolizes codeine, it turns codeine into another molecule that we all are pretty familiar with. And this is going to be called morphine. It's used in a lot of, you know, trying to be able to treat pain. Let's pretend that someone is a slow metabolizer of this particular substance. What's going to happen? Are they going to be able to have that analgesic effect when they're in pain? No. What about someone that's an ultra rapid metabolizer and you give them codeine? What can happen? They'll start producing morphine at super high concentrations, which can cause very, very, very serious side effects, especially if given to children. This can cause, obviously, death. It can be super fatal. So it's super, super important to understand just these two specific uh, cytochrome P450 enzymes, okay? This one, please remember, this one accounts for 50% of the available drugs that can be metabolized. And this one is specifically important because of polymorphisms that are kind of common in that particular allele. Some people can be slow, and some people can be ultra rapid, which can be very dangerous, okay? All right, so now we have a pretty good understanding of what's happening here with this cytochrome P450 complex. We're taking the drug, we're inserting an oxygen into it, whether it be through oxidation, redu reduction, or hydrolysis reactions, but we're primarily trying to hydroxylate. So what's the significance here? And this step here, this first step, is we're trying to hydroxylate the drug, produce an OH group. Now, after that, we can take this drug that we've made slightly polar, right? Slightly polar, not polar enough, but slightly polar. And we can take it to specific enzymes. There's tons and tons and tons of these enzymes. So for example, let's say that I had a group of these enzymes. Let's say here I have one guy here, okay? And this enzyme, he is the one of the most common, okay? That is gonna react with this drug here. Look at this guy, super tubby. This enzyme is called, we're going to label it UGT, UDP glucuronosyl transferase. Super important enzyme. If you don't remember any of these other enzymes that I'm going to mention, please remember this one. He is the most common enzyme that's going to be involved in this next step. So what can happen is, is let's say that we take this drug right here that we've hydroxylated, right? We've made it slightly more polar. We take and react it with this enzyme here. What this enzyme does is, is you have to think about the name. It's called UDP glucuronosyl transferase. It's basically a glucuronate molecule. Glucuronates are super, super polar. They have a bunch of, they have carboxylic acids and hydroxyl groups all over the place. So because of that, now what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna take this drug here, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add on, I'm gonna get rid of that H, and I'm gonna add on the glucuronate. So now what I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna show the structure, not necessary here. I'm just gonna put here a G for the glucuronate, okay? And this glucuronate, what I want you to remember, is super, super polar. So now this drug that we first had that was super nonpolar, we made it extremely polar. Okay, so now that is super important and we made it polar. So again, what, what do we start off with, with this drug, with just the one hydrogen? Super nonpolar super hydrophobic. Then what did we do? We took it through this cytochrome P450 system, hydroxylated it, and we made it uh, slightly polar. So we made it slightly polar. And then we kick up the juice and we react it with these specific enzymes like UGT, which can add a glucuronate group onto it and make it very polar. What are some of the other enzymes? Okay, some other ones that we should know about. Let's do orange here. Let's say here's another dude. They're all kind of pretty much the same, let's say, and they're all tubby. This one's another important one, super important one. It's called glutathione S transferase. Okay, glutathione S transferase. So now what do you think it's doing? It's transferring a glutathione molecule onto this drug here. So now I can take this guy, send it through this reaction. And what am I gonna have here? Now I'm gonna have my drug here with the oxygen and it's gonna be attached now to a glutathione molecule. Let's represent this with just a G again, but different color. And that glutathione molecule again is super charged and polar. We now just made this molecule 
a lot more polar. And again, we'll also talk about another significant thing about glutathione, which that is very, very important antioxidant molecule. We'll talk about that when we talk about alcohol metabolism. Okay, what are some other enzymes? Let's just keep going through here. Let's just keep banging these suckers away. Another really important enzyme is actually going to be called SLT, okay? And this stands for sulfotransferase enzymes. Sulfotransferase enzymes are also really important because they react with particular drugs. And guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna add a sulfate group onto it. So now we can have here, what? We'll have our drug, and what do we just add on to it? We add it on a sulfate group. And sulfates have a bunch of negative charges on them too, a bunch of different oxygens on them. And again, that's gonna make this molecule supercharged and super polar. There is other ones. I'm not gonna spend a significant amount of time talking about every single one of them. We'll mention one last one that is crucial here, and that'll finish her up here. Let's do this next one. Let's do this guy in black. And here's our last one here. And here's his face. He's excited to help in this metabolism here. He's a chunky guy too, and this is going to be in um, let's put NAT, NAT, okay, NAT. And this guy is called N-acetyltransferase. What do you think he does? He adds an acetyl group. He adds an acetyl group onto whatever the drug molecule is, again, trying to make the molecule more polar, okay? So let's represent that last one there with a acetyl group. Now, what did I say was the most significant one that I want you guys to remember? Let's mark it, let's not forget him. It's this one. Super, super important. We'll talk about it in the biliary system. Any type of deficiency in this enzyme can produce some very severe issues. One is called Krigler-Najjar syndrome. Very, very fatal if not treated. Another thing that can happen is what's called gray baby syndrome. If a child is actually born with a low glucuronidation, glucuronidation at capacity and you give them chloramphenicol, it can cause this baby to have a gray ashen appearance and it can be very, very dangerous. It can cause complete circulatory collapse if not treated quickly. So again, super important. So now, what did the liver just do? We have names for this phase and this phase. This phase here where we utilize the cytochrome P450 enzymes, which were located within the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, you know what else we call them? We call them microsomal. Okay, let's actually might write this down. These are called our micro. So there's a bunch of cytochrome in for P450 enzymes. You've probably heard of some of them, cytochrome, you've probably heard of electron transport chain within the mitochondria. It's the same type of enzyme, same basic structure. So it's super important that you understand that this is located within the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Whereas when other people think about cytochromes, they think about, oh, electron transport chain. Okay, so it's super important to remember that. This phase, this phase right here, where we took the drug and put a hydroxyl group onto it, where we hydroxylated it, this is called phase one, okay? And the purpose of phase one is to utilize the cytochrome P450 system to introduce an oxygen into the drug, making it more polar. Unfortunately, it's not good enough. We have to do something else. We have to take that slightly polar drug and then send it through some specific conjugation reactions. So what is these reactions here called? Let's highlight right under all of them. These are called Conjugation, conjugation reactions. And this conjugation reaction, which reutilizes N acetyltransferases, UDP glucuronosyl transferases, glutathione S transferases, sulfotransferases, so many other ones, these are responsible for the conjugation reactions, and this is called phase two. Okay? And again, we'll talk about some of the diseases associated with this particular enzyme whenever we talk about the biliary system. But again, remember that. We'll also talk about another function here uh, when we get into the biliary system because now these drugs, now that we've actually completely made them polar, they have a couple destinations. Again, we'll get into more detail on this. I'm just gonna take here and I'm gonna put a generic thing on. I'm just gonna put an R group on here which represents the conjugated substance, which could be an acetyl. Uh, a glucuronate, it could be glutathione, or it could be sulfate. What we'll do with this drug now that's super polar is it has to be eliminated, okay? 
or excreted. So now it has to diverge and go to three different ways. Okay, we could take it and actually put it into the urine to be excreted out. We could actually send it and put it into the blood plasma to have it go and function wherever it needs to function. Or we could excrete it out in the bile. Okay, and that's important and we'll talk about this whenever we take this drug now. What can we do? And we utilize specific transporters for all of these. And we'll talk about them. For example, when we talk about bile, it's super important to remember what's called MDR1. It's a specific transporter that excretes this actual drug out into the bile. Whereas these ones right here, you can use things like organic anion transport proteins. And again, we'll talk about these whenever we talk about the biliary system. But this part where we excrete it, so this part here, where it can be, let's say, secreted, okay, this is phase three, okay? And this is basically the secretion um, slash excretion, okay, of whatever that drug might be, okay? Super important that we have a good understanding of that, okay? So the liver, be thankful for this guy because he does a lot of cool things for us. Okay, next thing, I want to talk about something else that is super, super important that we should understand with the liver. We face it, it's a, a, a super epidemic in this life, we hear about it all the time, and that's alcoholism, okay? The liver is super, super crucial to that alcohol metabolism, but it doesn't utilize this normal cytochrome P450 system, kind of. Let me explain what I mean here. Let me take here alcohol. So let's say here we have our alcohol, okay? And the alcohol that we usually are ingesting, okay, is in the form of what's called ethanol, ethanol, which we usually, I can represent here as ETOH, okay? That alcohol, when we ingest it, you know where it's actually absorbed? It's absorbed across our stomach, right? And taken up via the hepatic portal system to the liver. Now, here's the thing. This alcohol, once it's in the liver, it has three pathways that it can go through, okay? One pathway that it can go through utilizes, let's actually draw here like a little green tube. Look at this guy, okay? He's gonna be going through this pathway here, okay? Now, this right here, if the alcohol is actually running through this particular area here, there's a special enzyme called cytochrome 2E1, okay? So we actually write it like this. Let's actually show this enzyme. Let's use the purple again. Here's this enzyme here. Let's actually draw a face. Let's put a face to that enzyme, okay? Look at that dude. He's all kinds of weird, all right? This guy right here is called cytochrome 2E1. This is a microsomal enzyme. Super important because he can actually metabolize the alcohol. So that's an important one to remember is that this cytochrome complex here within the located within the uh, endoplasmic reticulum can actually break down this alcohol and convert it into another molecule. And that molecule is called acetaldehyde. And this dude, he is bad news. Bad news bears this guy. Okay. Now, if this guy, this alcohol, reacts with the cytochrome 2E1, the cytochrome complex 2E1, converts it into acetaldehyde, that's one mechanism. The other one, the more common one, the one that results in the large amount of this activity here, is called, let's do this guy in blue here. Actually, let's do an orange, because it's an important one. It is called alcohol dehydrogenase which we represent as ADH. Please remember, this is not the ADH that you guys think about whenever it's responsible for the posterior pituitary. It's not the same one. This is alcohol dehydrogenase. This guy, he can actually work in this step here. And he can metabolize this alcohol and convert it into acetaldehyde. There's one other one. Okay, another one that is also crucial in this process here, and this is going to be another enzyme. Look at this dude. Let's actually draw him like this. Here's his little foot here. Here's his nose, his eyes. He's got like a little faux hawk going on there, and he's got his arms in this reaction here. 
This enzyme right here is super important in this process also. He is called catalase. Now some of you guys, if you guys know a little bit about your organelles, catalase is actually a very particular enzyme found in certain types of organelles. What are some of those organelles that contains this guy? They are peroxisomes. So this also, this alcohol can be metabolized by peroxisomes. Peroxosomes. And again, these peroxisomes contain this particular enzyme here called catalase. And when the catalase reacts with alcohol, it can convert that alcohol into acetaldehyde. Now, one of the things that you need to remember, and this is where a lot of the damage comes from drinking lots of alcohol, so remember that next time you guys think about drinking a lot, right? From this, particularly from this system, from the cytochrome 2E1, two really bad things happen here. One is because of the cytochrome system, it can generate a lot of what's called reactive oxygen species. So they call them reactive oxygen species. What are some of these bad boys? Just a couple, I don't wanna go over like too crazy. Some of them could be like hydrogen peroxide, super toxic one, right? That's one really, really bad one. Another one is your superoxide anion, your superoxide. Another one could be hypochlorous acid. Another one could be the hydroxyl radical. We talked about that, that can react with copper and it can actually be the result of copper and iron whenever they undergo the Fenton reactions. So some of these are super, super dangerous. Now, why are they dangerous? You know what these reactive oxygen species love to do? They like to donate their little random little loner electron. And when they do that, when they donate some of those electrons, they donate to very crucial molecules inside of our cell. What are some of them? Look here. This guy, you guys better know which one this one is right away. DNA. And not just DNA, but it can even be RNA, but DNA is one of the really bad ones because if these reactive oxygen species come over and damage the DNA, what can it do? Produce mutations. What happens if you have mutations? It can lead to cancer. So again, that's one of the really, really dangerous things here is that these reactive oxygen species can come over here and go ba bam They can start really laying some damage down on the DNA. What else? They can lay down some damage on certain types of enzymes that are crucial in a lot of these different processes within the body. So here, let's make a little enzyme dude. Okay, look at this guy. He's okay now, but guess what? Once he gets uh, a lot of these different reactive oxygen species on him, what happens? Bam, 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 bam. All right, he gets all fricked up too. All right, so that's really, really dangerous here. When these reactive oxygen species accumulate due to excessive alcohol consumption, they can cause a lot of DNA and protein damage. So it can lead to a lot of DNA and protein damage. Super nasty stuff, right? And we'll talk about something that the liver actually synthesized that is crucial to preventing that, that you can, you can thank the liver for. Okay, what else is another negative thing about having too much alcohol consumption? If there's a lot of alcohol consumption, not only do you produce a lot of reactive oxygen species because of increasing this pathway, but there's a crucial molecule here called Na depositive. Look at this guy just chilling, doing his little thing here. But there's so much of this reaction that you're generating a lot of NADHs. Why is this bad? Here, let me tell you. Let's come over here so we have plenty of room. If we have lots of NADHs, what does that mean? It takes it to the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain generates a lot of ATP. So now let's follow this. High NADH leads to high ATP activity. So now go back and think about the Krebs cycle. So let's say here I have my little TCA cycle, my Krebs cycle. Here we'll put TCA cycle. Same thing as Krebs, remember that. And who is feeding into it? Acetyl CoA. He was feeding into this. And if you remember, there was a lot of different enzymes that were allosterically regulated by ATP. So if ATP levels are high, what is that telling our TCA cycle to do? Stop. So it's going to inhibit a lot of this TCA cycle activity. And instead, it's gonna drive the acetyl-CoA's into fatty acid synthesis. Uh-oh. A lot of fatty acids, guess what that can do? Lead to a lot of fatty liver. And so again, what can this produce as a result? It can produce a increase 
fatty liver. Okay, so that's not too good either. All right, now, just to finish off here, the acetaldehyde, how is this relatable? So how does this alcohol, because it actually counts for about, it actually counts for about seven, seven kilocalories per gram. So seven kilocalories per gram. More than carbohydrates and proteins. That's why you can get fat with these bad boys here, right? So acetaldehyde, he can go and he can react with something else. Two things, actually. He's not a good, he's not a good man. He can get converted into acetate. You know what acetate can be converted into? Let's follow this down here. React this bad boy with a specific molecule, CoA. So take here and add on a coenzyme A, and guess what you get when you take the acetate and combine it with that? You get acetyl-CoA. And again, lots of alcohol can lead to a lot of acetyl-CoA that can just continue to shunt into forming fat, or it can be utilized to make a little bit of energy if necessary. Here's the last thing I want to talk about with the acetaldehyde. The acetaldehyde, it can do something else. It actually is kind of like a chain, if you want to think about it. It really binds onto something and just makes everything nasty. Let's say here, again, I have some type of, let's put it here, let's just put it here a little happy face, okay? This guy is happy. Some type of macromolecule. Let's just assume that it's a protein. Let's assume that it's a protein. When acetaldehyde comes over here, look what he does. So I'm gonna represent him with an A. He binds onto this guy. When he binds onto this guy, guess what happens? Wah, wah. Okay, he becomes sad. Because guess what's gonna happen with this? We can take this, and we call this, whenever acetaldehyde binds onto a macromolecule, like maybe a protein, it forms what's called a adduct, an acetaldehyde adduct. Guess what he can do with that? He can take and present that. Our hepatocytes can take and present, I'll say that here's the cell membrane. Here's going to be a, a protein. Let's actually do it like this. We can take that and represent that acetaldehyde adduct out here. And then what will that do? That'll activate our immune system. Guess what it'll activate? It'll activate a bunch of different types of lymphocytes to come to the area. So now we're gonna have a bunch of lymphocytes coming to the area. And we might even have a lot of neutrophils coming to the area. And this can lead to a lot of damage. Okay, because they're going to attack our own tissues. So that's one of the negative things about this is that one thing is it can be presented on the cell which can activate our immune system. Another thing is when it binds to this actual macromolecule, that macromolecule no longer can function. So let's actually just do decrease in function. Well, let's actually do this. Loss of function. So now whatever that macromolecule is, he can't do what he wants to do. Thankfully, our liver is so kind to us and it does something so cool that can help to prevent a lot of this reactive oxygen species damage. Now, we talked about them a little bit here was the glutathione. Glutathione is actually very, very important in our liver. You know what it can actually do here? Let me, let me tell you what it can do. Let me move this fatty liver over here. Increase fatty acid synthesis. Again, we said that, that can lead to a fatty liver, okay? So just to keep that there. Now, the glutathione, it exists in two forms. Okay, so let me put it like this. I'm gonna put G here. That's a glutathione molecule. Usually it's in what's called a dimer form. So in other words, one form is it has, let's say it has this thiol group here, okay? The other form is the glutathione is in a disulfide bond. Ooh. Now, it can go back and forth between these two. So look, it can go here, or it can go back to here. Now, the glutathione is a very, very important antioxidant. So what is this G representing? It is glutathione, super important antioxidant. Inside of our liver, we're generating tons of reactive oxygen species all the time. What this glutathione does is, let's pretend we take hydrogen peroxide. Let's take hydrogen peroxide. The glutathione has the ability to take that hydrogen peroxide or other reactive oxygen species and convert that into less toxic forms. Let's say like water in this case. Now, 
what, we, what happened, the glutathione actually took on some of those electrons, okay? And when it did that, it actually got oxidized. So this is the reduced form. This form here with the thiols, this is the reduced form. And this form is the oxidized form. When he reacts with the reactive oxygen species, he goes into the oxidized form. He sacrifices himself. But guess who we have coming to our rescue to help us out so, so much? NADPH. NADPH, where did we get that from? The pentose phosphate pathway. He can be converted. He can drop off his hydride ions onto the glutathione, and he can convert into NADP+. But when he drops those hydrides and electrons off, he converts the oxidized glutathione back into the reduced, which helps to continue to decrease the reactive oxygen species. So be thankful for that glutathione, and our liver has a bunch of it, okay? I and engineers, in this video, we talked a lot about xenobiotic metabolism. I hope it made sense. I really do hope that you guys enjoyed it. And uh, another lecture, we're going to talk a lot about biosynthesis. And it's super, super important because it goes hand in hand with xenobiotic metabolism. So I really hope to see you guys in that video. All right, engineers, if you guys did like this video, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, if you guys get a chance, go check out our Facebook, our Instagram, maybe even our Patreon account. As always, Ninja Nerds, until next time.